webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube page um, to view or share uh, once it's over and has been uploaded. So I did want to let you know that it will be available along with the, what, the rest of our um, February series on self-care and organizational trauma. They're all uploaded to our YouTube page as well as several other uh, webinar offerings from throughout the year from the coalition. So if there's anything there that you would like to view, uh, you can just search YouTube for TN Coalition and you will find our page. Throughout this morning, uh, if you do have questions or concerns, um, please just type them in your chat box and I will be checking that periodically and answer questions as we go along. I will let you know that this webinar might be a bit shorter today than our normal hour long, um, but we will see how it goes and what questions everyone has as we go forward. So let's go ahead and get started. So, I want to talk a little bit about what vicarious trauma within individuals look like. Um, and it starts with this trauma exposure response. So, individuals who work in helping fields, uh, whether you are a victim advocate, whether you are CPS, a first responder, an emergency room, uh, nurse, uh, victim witness coordinator, whatever it looks like, if you are in a helping profession where you are working with people who, um, who have experienced some form of trauma during their lives, and that's why they've brought, you know, they've come to you, they've come to your organization, or that's why you're interacting with them. It is incredibly normal for those of us in these fields to experience vicarious trauma. And like I said, that begins with what is called the trauma exposure response. And the trauma exposure response basically means once you have seen trauma, once you have seen things happen, um, and the aftermath of trauma in your clients and in the individuals that you work with, you can't unsee that. So once you've been a witness of this type of trauma, once you have um, spoken to a survivor, once you've dealt with a victim of violence, you can't turn off that piece of yourself that has seen that that knows it exists out in the world. It changes your view of the world, um, at least to, to a small degree. So it may, you know, I've worked with advocates who are, um, you know, almost refuse to allow their children to go to uh, sleepovers because they know horrible things that happen in the world. I work with people who are, you know, <clears throat> who see red flags and they're they're trained to look for red flags and in, in individuals and in behavior and relationships and that is something that becomes sort of second nature as you do this work for a long time so it's the way that um, helping work or advocacy or trauma work changes your view of the world and from that flows a lot of the vicarious trauma the things that we experience as helpers, as advocates, as first responders. Um, so exposure to others' trauma doubles the risk that social workers, advocates, other people in helping fields will experience post-traumatic stress symptoms. While the rate of secondary trauma or vicarious trauma, as it's sometimes called, is high, the awareness of trauma's effect on them is low. And I think that's partially because as advocates, as social workers, as first responders, whatever your entrance into this field is, we are very much focused on others. We are very much focused on those individuals outside ourselves who come to us for help. Um, who come to us for advocacy, who come to us for case management, therapy, 
uh, whatever that looks like. And because we are focused on others and, and the purpose of our job and our mission is to help others, to help others heal from trauma or to heal from physical injury or, or mental or emotional stress, we often feel guilty to turn that lens on ourselves and take time to make sure that we are okay. So we often ignore the effects that trauma is having on ourselves because we feel guilty that we're taking time to help someone else or we're being selfish by focusing on ourselves or we feel guilty because the trauma hasn't happened directly to us so we shouldn't be affected by it in this way. And so we, we are often ignoring signs and symptoms in ourselves that we are trained to, to see and to respond to and to mitigate in our clients. And so the secondary trauma that we experience, there's a few things that you need to know about it. Number one, it's normal. Vicarious trauma or secondary stress happens to everyone who is in this field. It is a normal response and it is a response that is, is essentially inevitable. There are very few people who work in advocacy or in a helping based profession who do not at some point or another experience vicarious trauma. But this trauma is on a continuum. So on one end, when you have vicarious trauma that's very normal, that's experienced by virtually everyone, and on the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, you have burnout, which is the extreme, which is experienced by very few, but it can be long-lasting and damaging in its effects. So we're going to look a little bit at that continuum. <clears throat> So first we have vicarious trauma or secondary stress. It's, I still care, but I'm suffering too. So we have used our empathy to work with survivors and victims of trauma or abuse or neglect or whatever type of violence in our particular role. And we take on their stories because when you are empathetic and when you are using your empathy and you're opening yourselves up to someone's story in order to help them, you are also opening yourself up to, to absorb and carry a portion of that pain and a portion of that story. And so the stories affect us deeply. Um, even those of us who may not be um, in direct contact with clients, so you may not be um, a direct care person, you may be the person who does the financials of the organization, or you may be the person who does marketing and media for an organization, but if you are hearing the stories from your um, peers, from your coworkers, if they're sharing the stories in order to, to balance themselves and to sort of get it off their own chest, then that experience of vicarious trauma through it spreads throughout an organization. So everyone within that organization, whether they are directly in contact with survivors or not, has the potential to feel that secondary stress or that vicarious trauma. I still care, I'm still able to do this job, but I'm suffering too. And it's at this point, this end of the spectrum, as I said, that's very normal that everyone sort of experiences in their time um, as an advocate. And it's at this point where self-care and that those interventions can really kind of mitigate that trauma and heal that trauma and heal that stress and allow you to keep going and keep doing a high level of work and care. 
without it affecting your job performance. So this is where self-care can be preventative and healing and kind of keep you from sliding further down that continuum. And the next step of the continuum is compassion fatigue. So you are no longer able to manage the weight that you're carrying. It feels like a burden pushing down on you and I still care, but I need a break. I can no longer keep going. I can no longer keep doing my job without having a break, without having an intervention. Um, and so with compassion fatigue, it's easiest for me to think of this concept as having, um, having compassion and empathy like a muscle. And if you overwork your muscles through hours and hours and hours of physical burden and physical stress, then your muscles are going to become fatigued and you're not, you're going to be in pain. You're not going to feel like you can lift things. You're not going to be, feel like you can move easily. Um, <clears throat> you may injure yourself or pull a muscle because you're overworking. And so compassion and empathy are like muscles. And if we've overworked them without any periods of rest and recuperation and rejuvenation, then we cannot keep going at that rate. So again, this is a spot where self-care can be um, an intervention. However, you need more self-care you need more serious interventions here than you do when you're just experiencing symptoms of vicarious trauma and vicarious stress. In order for it to be effective now, you, when you've gotten to this point, your inter interventions have to be more serious and, and longer. And so the next, the other end of that spectrum is burnout. And when we hit burnout, it typically happens when we have not engaged in self-care, community care up until this point. We have not engaged in prevention or interventions up until this point. And so we have not done those things which we need to do to care for ourselves and to mitigate the secondary stress and the compassion fatigue that we're feeling and we get to the point of burnout which is I don't care anymore at all. It's not that I just need a break. It's not that I just need to refresh or recoup or refill my wells. It's that I cannot find it within myself to care anymore. And when you hit this point of burnout, you are beyond the realm where self-care can be an effective intervention. Yes, you still need self-care because we all still need self-care. You still need the, to do those things that <clears throat> make you feel healthier and make you feel more in control. But you have passed the point where doing those things can allow you to then go back and do your job effectively because you have become so burnt out that you do not have anything left to contribute to, to. You don't have any more capacity within you to be compassionate in these same ways. Um, so that's why it's so important that we intercede and intervene before we reach this point. And when we get to burnout, this is the point where we see a lo loss of compassion toward the clients that we're seeing, depersonalization, so we can no longer empathize, we can no longer put ourselves in their shoes. Um, we get a loss of the ability to sort of understand what they're going through or to understand the choices that they've made. We get a lot of really reactionary and punitive rules 
um, put in place around the clients that we're seeing and a lot of backlash towards those people that we're supposed to be helping because we cannot um, we cannot find it within us <clears throat> to care because that opens us up for more pain and we have so much pain and so much trauma, um, it's built up to sort of a bursting point or a burning point. And you can sort of think of it like, um, like a house on fire. And if we can put the fire out quickly enough, we can rebuild, we can go on about our lives, we may just have, you know, the stove may be a little scorched, but we can replace that and it's fine. But if we get to the point of burnout, um, there is nothing left that we can salvage here. And, and so we're still alive and we're, we can still move on and we can still get a new house or a new job. Um, but there's nothing left that we can salvage here. And that's why it's so important to to make sure that we are interceding and to make sure that we are um, employing self-care um, to prevent ourselves from getting to this point. And so to that end, one of the most important pieces of coping <clears throat> with these types of jobs, with these types of um, stress and trauma that we're seeing day in and day out is acknowledging that it will affect us. Acknowledging that secondary stress or vicarious trauma is a reality. And once we acknowledge that, once we say, yes, this exists, yes, this is normal, um, yes, this is something that affects all of us, it becomes that much easier for for us to intervene because we know that it happens and we know that it is something that we have to address. So once we acknowledge that it's reality and acknowledge that it's something that we have to address, then we can start normalizing self-care and saying that self-care is just one more piece of the puzzle of taking care of our whole selves, just like drinking water and getting plenty of sleep and eating and whatever else, whatever other pieces that we have to do, you know, going to the doctor, brushing our teeth, taking vitamins, all of these normal things that are routine pieces of our lives that many of us engage in or most of us engage in to take care of our physical selves, self-care should be added to that list as a normal everyday piece of caring for our mental selves and our emotional selves. And so another part of that, another piece of making sure that we are taking care of ourselves is thinking about the work that we do and the expectation that we had going into that work versus the reality of the work. How is what you're doing in your work different than what you thought you would be doing? So for instance, many of us come into helping fields with this idea that we are going to be constantly um, working with people who are victims of trauma and helping them and watching them heal and seeing all these great success stories and we're going to make a difference and we're going to change minds and we're going to change hearts. And we didn't kind of go into it understanding that the changing minds and hearts maybe comes with several hours a week of paperwork or grant reports or um, you know, cleaning the kitchen in the shelter five times a week, or having people yell at you on the phone, or, <clears throat> you know, 
all of the small things that we don't expect, that, that we don't understand when we come into this field as part of the work. And when we don't sort of take the time to reconcile expectation versus reality, we have a lot of disconnect. Um, it's hard to be connected with our passion for the work and with our vision for the work and with the mission of our organization if we feel disconnected from the reality of the work. So taking a minute to really examine um, and kind of come to terms with expectation versus reality is helpful in that it allows us to really start thinking about um, our work as a whole and not this picture in our head that we thought it would be. It helps us understand that, you know, we are still changing people's lives and we are still helping people, even if it doesn't look exactly the same as we thought. Um, because for a lot of us, when we get into a position of advocacy or or um, case management or social work or whatever it is, and we and our job is not exactly what we thought it would be, we can feel very disillusioned and we can feel as if we are somehow failing because we are not living up to our own sort of unrealistic expectations. So when we take an honest look at what the reality of our job is and all of the pieces that it, it that accompany it, we can understand that we are succeeding. It just doesn't look, success may not look exactly the way that we thought it would. Or that we need to think of other ways to measure our successes and other ways to understand the impact that we've had. Um, and maybe that looks like a change in the way that you gather your data at your organization. Um, and the questions that you ask survivors um, when you survey them about their experiences. Maybe you need to rethink those questions or, or add additional questions to really look at how you measure the success of what you're doing. Um, and for instance, just to give you an example, if any of you have ever, um, <clears throat> have ever come to our Tommy Burke's um, Academy in in the summer at UT Chattanooga, and you have seen Stacy Miller give her amazing workshop about batter's intervention programs and how batter's intervention programs um, think that they should measure success, which is many of them think that um, the measure of success comes from the behavior of the abuser either during or after um, they take the, the batter's intervention class. And while that is something that you certainly have to report for grants, for instance, and you certainly have to gather that data, um, Stacy in her, in her wonderful workshop argues that in order to truly measure success, they should be looking at the ways in which what they are doing is helping the survivors to stay safe or to reach safety. And so it's changing and sort of flipping the way that we are looking at the work we do and the outcomes of that work. Um, and so how are you gathering that data? Or are you gathering that data at all? Is your organization um, reaching out to and surveying clients that you have worked with and are you collecting data on success stories and on um, the great experiences and the ways that you've helped people? Are you seeing those stories or is that not something you're collecting? And if it's not something that you're collecting, 
maybe you want to rethink that because maybe collecting that or asking those questions or, or reframing the way that you're looking at it is going to give your organization and your staff a chance to see the impact that they're making in a different way, um, which can be incredibly healing and incredibly heartening um, and can be a really powerful tool of self-care within an organization. And so um, just as an aside, if you would like to see, if you have never, and you would like to see Stacy talking about batters intervention programs and doing her wonderful workshop, I believe that she's presenting at our annual conference in April. So um, it's April 10th through 12th, and I'm not quite sure um, if I can remember right off which of the days that she's presenting on, but just keep that in mind. Um, and so... The next thing I want to talk about, I, I mentioned it briefly earlier, but many of us feel as if taking time for self-examination and self-care takes either takes away from the survivors that we are working with or is selfish in some way because we are so attuned and so focused on helping others that it seems selfish to care for ourselves. So I think this, um, this is a very simple method of reminding yourself that it's okay to engage in self-care and to work through that. So thinking about these three questions. Number one, does your decision to engage in self-care hurt anyone? Does your decision, is your decision to engage in, in self-care morally wrong? And are you likely to regret your decision to engage in self-care down the road? And probably 99.9% .9 of the time, what you're going to find is that your answer to all three of those questions is typically going to be no. Um, for instance, let's say that your method of engagement in self-care is to, um, to take a 15-minute break during your work day and go for a walk, you know, around the block and get some fresh air. Number one, does taking a break hurt anyone? Well, no, probably not. Everybody should be encouraged or encouraging their staff to take breaks and to take care of themselves um, just because that's what we're supposed to do as a workforce. Um, and certainly walking around the block is not going to hurt anyone. Number two, is the decision morally wrong? Well, no. I would say that for most of us, we're not going to say that our decision to take a walk around the block is morally wrong. Are we going to regret the decision down the road? Again, likely no. We're likely going to say, you know, I was able to stretch my legs. I was able to get some fresh air. I was able to get a little bit of exercise, get outside, get moving. And when I got back to the office or to wherever my job is, I felt refreshed. I felt better. And I got back to work. <clears throat> so nine times out of ten, finding those pieces of time to care for yourself is not selfish. Um, and it's good for you to take those moments to care for yourself. Now, I do want you to think about things like delegation of tasks and making sure that you are not saying yes to everything that comes across your table. Instead, you are taking a really um, honest look at your time and your energy and what you have going on <clears throat> before you say yes to another project. 
And sometimes delegation or sometimes having to say no or having to say yes, but it's not going to be my first priority, it may take me a while to get to it, may feel really bad and may feel like it's hurting someone. But thinking about is it best to be honest about what your capacity to perform these tasks are compared to your current workload and if you're overloaded and if you're overwhelmed, um, is it better to be honest and say, no, I can't add this to my list today? Or is it better to say yes to everything that comes across and not be able to perform that task um, and not be able to do that project or do that job to the best of your ability? So is it better to say yes and risk or say no and risk disappointing someone or to say yes and you know, now you're performing 30 things on your to-do list, but none of them are getting done to the best of your ability. So think about, you know, <clears throat> think about the reality of when you feel as if you might be disappointing someone, how, how is your time being better served? And then remind ourselves that we matter as individuals, and what we have to offer the world matters. The work that we do matters. Um, the people <clears throat> that we help certainly matter a great deal, but if we are burnt out, if we are struggling, if we are emotionally exhausted, if we have, um, have emptied our wells of resources and our wells of empathy, then we cannot be helping our clients and survivors and, and whoever to the best of our ability. So because we all matter and because what we have to offer the world matters, it is so important that we are engaging in self-care in order to refill ourselves and rejuvenate ourselves and be able to continue the incredibly important work that we do. So, um, I also want to point out that self-care does not have to be this daunting task. Self-care doesn't have to be, you know, Heather from the Coalition told me I have to engage in self-care, so now I have to find time to fit in an hour-long yoga class three times a week into my already packed schedule, and that just doesn't make any sense for my life. Self-care can be simple things. Self-care can be a, you know, 10-minute walk around the block. Self-care can be um, taking, you know, two or three minutes to take deep breaths or to listen to, you know, one of those little five-minute guided relaxation apps or to pet your cat or to, um, <clears throat> to listen to your favorite song or to do a page in, in your adult coloring book or to, you know, take five minutes to read a couple more pages in, in the book that you're working on or whatever it looks like. It can be very small, simple things that you can build into your day. Self-care, you know, for you, self-care might be from 3 to 4 p.m., I am turning off my emails and I am just going to buckle down and get this finished without my email dinging at me every five minutes. And then at 4 o'clock, I can turn it back on and check what's happened, but for that hour, I'm going to be email free. And that might feel like self-care to you, and that's fine, because whatever feels rejuvenating to you and whatever feels a little bit freeing to you, you know, it's about individuality and it's about what your needs are. So <clears throat> turning off the ringer on your phone for 30 minutes a day, you know, obviously if you have the hotline at your agency and if you're in charge of the hotline that day, then you cannot turn off the ringer on your phone. But 
you know, if you're a day where you're in the office or whatever and you have somebody who's backing you up and you can do that for, you know, once a week or whatever it looks like, then maybe that is what feels like self-care to you. Um, if you can take a minute to actually step away from your office, to actually step away from your desk, to step away from your computer and have a real lunch, then that is self-care for you that day. If you can take a minute to actually take a break to actually have those moments of rejuvenation throughout your day, then that is self-care. And it doesn't have to be a huge time commitment. It doesn't have to be a huge burden. It doesn't have to be expensive or time consuming. Um, it can be very simple, but we're talking about small things that can rejuvenate you throughout the day. <clears throat> One of those things, especially within your organization, can and should be celebrating successes. Using examples of activities that your organization engages in frequently and deliberately, um, thinking about what success looks like for you that week. And it may be, you know, this has been a really successful week because we have um, taken five people to their court appointments and sat and helped them through court and been with them through the process and we have done that this week and that is a really successful week. Or, you know, we have four people who have left shelter and who are in transitional housing this week and that is amazing and that is a successful week. Or we are, were able to open our doors to 12 people this week and we have 12 people in our shelter and our shelter is full and that is amazing and that is a successful week. Now, obviously I'm not saying it's a great thing that someone has to come to shelter or it's a great thing that someone has to go to court because of abuse or violence that they're experiencing. What, what I'm saying is that the success is that your organization is there to help them through it. And oftentimes we go throughout our weeks and we do what we have to do because it's our job and because it helps people and because it's what we're supposed to be doing. And we don't think about the fact that it is, it is a success and it is something to celebrate that we exist and are helping people. And yes, it is a shame that we have to exist, but we're doing the work. You all are doing the work. You're helping people. You're bringing people in. You're giving them a chance. You're giving them places to stay. You're helping them set goals, you're helping them heal, whatever your job is, whatever your position is in helping people. And so celebrating those concrete activities that you all do every day and considering those things successes can really change the way we view our day-to-day -day and our week-to-week. -week. So, I'm going to leave you with a few tools. This is just an example of a self-care plan um, where we filled in things that we can do with our minds that are self-care, things that we can do with our body, things that we can do that are under spirit, people in our lives that are supportive that we can call or we can text or we can turn to if we need to talk. Um, goals and things that we want to accomplish with our self-care. And again, like I said, self-care doesn't have to be these huge things. Self-care can be drinking a cup of tea, sleeping an extra hour of a night, taking, you know, several five-minute breaks here and there throughout the day, um, listening to a favorite song. You know, and so if the mind, body, spirit thing, you know, if that doesn't feel authentic to you or that if that doesn't connect with you, you can think about it as um, 
mental, physical, emotional. Um, you can divide it up and think about different aspects of self-care in whatever way that makes sense to you. And so there are, there are a million of these little plans that you can find on the internet. If you Google self-care plan, you can find them, you can fill them out, um, you can take a minute to think about what you want to do more of. If you, you know, if you're thinking about planning self-care for yourself, what am I already doing that's great that I want to keep doing? What do I maybe want to do more of? So I'm going to ask you all to take two minutes real quick and in your chat box, just let us know if, if you want to share either what you are already doing for self-care during the day that you think is just a great thing that you want to keep doing or what you would like to do more of for self-care if you want to share with the group your ideas this morning. And I'll give you a minute or two to kind of put that in the chat box. All right, so a few of you have shared. Um, and I'm going to give about one more minute for people to kind of add what they want. All right, so a couple of you said um, practicing yoga, reading before bed, going home, which is a really big one, um, leaving the office for lunch at least once a week. I think that's wonderful. Um, taking mini breaks with coworkers, that's another really good one. So thank you all so much for sharing. Um, Someone said counseling, and that's wonderful. Um, I think it's really important, especially for those of us in this type of field, to, um, to really consider and think about talking with someone, um, whether it's going to counseling or therapy, because oftentimes we, um, we can't really talk about the things that we're seeing in our day-to-day our -day jobs with our families because either we don't want to burden them or we have, you know, very strict confidentiality that's really important. So having that, um, that neutral outside person that we can talk to is wonderful. Um, read for 15 minutes, drink tea, listen to music, play chess, play the piano. All of these are really great suggestions. So thank you all so much for sharing those. Um, And so another thing you can do, and this is just another example of self-care planning, you can find, you can do a weekly plan and really lay out um, one or two things that you're going to do every single day through the week to self-care. 
Um, so you can find lots of really wonderful tools. And I do want to, um, before we leave this morning, I want to turn your attention to um, the handout. So on your little dashboard or whatever you want to call it on the right side of your screen, um, along with the chat box and everything else, you will see um, a little handouts tab. And under that tab, you will see several different things. Um, a coping skills flyer, a self-care plan, self-care packet. Self -care. So I've, I've put together several tools for you to look at. Um, some, some examples like I've shown you of self-care plans that you can fill in. Um, of little weekly charts. Um, one of them is a self-care assessment where you can go through and kind of see how you're doing in different areas of your life, in different areas of self-care, and that will give you some ideas of, of ways you can implement self-care if you're not already doing that. So all of those things are there, all of those really wonderful resources that I hope that you will take a few minutes um, today and look through, and also um, your certificate of attendance for this webinar is among those handouts. You'll see Vicarious Trauma Training Certificate. Um, and all you have to do to receive or to get those handouts is just click on them, and they will open in a different little tab on your computer, and you'll be able to save or print or download those um, and, and save those. So I do want to let you know that they're there. Um, like I said, there are several different tools. Um, and to that end, I am going to end this webinar. Um, we are about 10 minutes till 11, so I want you to take that extra 10 minutes for self-care, whether that's looking through the self-care plans and the handouts that I'm providing you, whether that's taking 10 minutes to take a walk, to listen to a favorite song, to watch a funny YouTube video, whatever that looks like for you, I want you to take that extra few minutes to care for yourselves this morning. Um, I will stay on the line for a couple more minutes, so if anybody does have questions, feel, feel free to put them in the chat box or to email me and I will get back to you. Um, and I. And don't forget to grab your handouts before you before you sign off of the webinar. Um, <clears throat> so thank you again for attending this morning. I'm so glad you could be here. As I said, I will be here to answer questions for several minutes. But once you've downloaded your handouts and you're ready, you can feel free to uh, to sign off. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>